hear that sometimes what people do intend for bad turns out to work out for good. You were relieved of your AU permanent representative job because powers that be were uncomfortable with your stance on new colonization, especially with the overbearing influence of France on states it once colonized. But it appears that no one saw the outrage that would greet that and even how much more popular uh, your gospel was going to get. Did you envisage all of this at all since 2019? Not at all. Uh, even during my tenure, I was simply delivering on my mandate. As a medical doctor, I went to Washington, of course, reluctantly. Uh, but of course, once a doctor, always a doctor. I started making diagnosis while I was, uh, I was in Washington. And my diagnosis, uh, first and foremost, became the ignorance that we had of our understanding of Africa, not only as, as Africans, not as black people around the world, but even members of Congress themselves, the US government, they really don't understand Africa. So I set out to address the issue of the ignorance about what, go, what was going on in Africa, educating the African diaspora primarily and secondarily those in the US government and anybody else that wished to listen to the message. Because I felt that that was the root cause of what was going on in Africa, the lack of understanding and appreciation of what was really going on in Africa, and more importantly, identifying the root causes. And for Africa, I came to the conclusion that France was the biggest risk to peace and security and overall African development, particularly in West Africa, because of one particular agreement that they would make the African heads of state sign when they were receiving their independence. It was a horrible, continues to be a horrible document that sadly it has been allowed to continue to this very day to the serious detriment of the Africans. So I set out to educate the Africans about France. Others would say, why didn't you talk about the British and all other colonizers? Yes, we would speak about them as well. But the route, the one that is leading the park the one that is taking the crown of the abuse and exploitation, it is France. And I felt very strongly that if France can come to the table and, uh, and uh, also uh, renegotiate those contracts, if France can leave Africa, that would be the beginning of true liberation. And I'm talking economic liberation of the African continent. So France is leading the pack because of its deep roots within Africa, because of the uh, agreements that they, the heads of states were made to sign during independence of Africa. Yeah, by that document, I, I know you were referring to the pact on the continued uh, colonization. I, I, I think you've made reference to it in quite a number of your speeches, the continued colonization of African states. Is that it? That's correct, yes. That continues to be in place today. And through that document, uh, African countries, the former French colonies, uh, upwards, it used to be 85% of, the, of their bank reserves had to be deposited with the French treasury. It's now down to around 50 to 60%. To this day, poor countries are sending their bank reserves to France. To this day, poor countries, the first right of refusal of all, of all contracts, public, private, large, small, French companies, the first right of refusal. To this day, all minerals discovered yet to be discovered, France has the first right of ref refusal. To this day, those former French colonies, all their uh, mi military must be trained by France. All their military equipment must be purchased from France. And France has a presence in their countries and can invade those countries without notice should they feel their French interests are being violated. So at every level, the document is horrible and it remains in place today. I was horrified when I began to see the extent to which people simply did not know. So I made that my mission number one. Because as a medical doctor, if you're dealing with, uh, with, a, with let's say, an accident situation, you first uh, assess uh, the heart. Does the patient have a heartbeat? Is the patient breathing? You don't worry about the broken bone. You don't worry about other peripheral damages. You start with the core. If the patient is breathing, if the patient has a heartbeat, you must revive them, get a heartbeat, get the lungs, get them breathing, and then you can deal with other peripheral issues. So I felt the heartbeat of what was ailing Africa started with France. If we can deal with what France is doing in Africa, dealing with the rest of the colonizers will be easy, for their roots are not as entrenched into Africa as the French roots to this day.
Well, there are a number of um, Africans who have also delved very deep into this. I mean, I mentioned uh, Kwame Nkrumah, you know, r- right from the days of independence of many African countries. He also worked very hard for the independence of Ghana. We also have literary, mm-hmm. literary giants who have also delved into this. Uh, one of them is a Nigerian, Chinua Achebe, uh, who has, you know, delved very deep into, you know, talking about the colonization and, you know, the New colonization of African minds and even our literature and how all of this seeps very deep. I mean, things fall apart is continues to be, uh, you know, quite a literary work that everyone refers to. Um, but some people say, you know, we talk about root causes and immediate causes. Uh, what share, if you were to distribute, uh, say, causes, uh, I don't want to say blames, but if you were to, yeah, maybe I should use that word blame. If you were to distribute blame um, along root causes and immediate causes of where Africa currently is, unable to fully achieve her potential, how will you distribute the blame? I'm going to start with, of course, uh, the uh, the mind, which of, is where at the end of the day, that is where the problem really is. The legacy of colonization remains to be a serious issue for the African. It is the legacy of colonization that makes it difficult for us as a people to push back. Let me give a very simplistic example, and I use simplistic examples because I want people to really understand what's going on. Using the example of Niger, there is a mutiny in the school cafeteria. The students are sick and tired of a bully who's been taking their lunch for centuries. Finally, finally, they've garnered enough courage. They now have enough knowledge to understand and they're ready to stand up and push back against the bully. The question then becomes, why has it taken the students so long to to stand up and push the bully back? It's because the students have been made to believe that you are inferior. The students have been threatened. The students believe that they're not as good as the bully. The headmaster, some have been smart enough and have tried to push back, guess what? They were assassinated. But finally, the students now have enough knowledge. Question is, why has it taken this long for the students to have enough courage? But be it as it may, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of colonization left the African in a feeling inferior, feeling they're incapable, admiring everything else that somebody else is doing, that everything African is undesirable, that we're always looking to what those who don't look like us are doing, and we want to emulate what they are doing. Mm -hmm. That, to me, the biggest risk to Africa's development is the mind. When we can... Yes, go ahead. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted, you know, to focus on that particular question. If you were to distribute, and I'm not going to, you know, take away from the fact mm-hmm. that you said, you know, the mind is where we need to start from. But if you were to distribute it in terms of, you know, uh, apportioning blames to the root mm-hmm. cause and the immediate cause, because people have also pointed at how it is that Africans themselves are conducting themselves and, you know, do not seem to have sufficient compassion for the people as African leaders, do not have sufficient compassion for the people that they lead. Um, where, how would you distribute this particular blame? Would you say 50% to root causes, 50% to immediate causes? In what proportion would you share it? I would say the biggest problem right now is the mind. I still believe it is the mind. Secondly, The average African leader is fighting with their hands tied behind their back and in some cases also blindfolded. Um, I really don't want us to get lost in the mud about peripheral issues. Remember what I said, you get into an accident situation, first you are said the heartbeat, does the patient have a pulse? Is the patient breathing? We worry about the blown up eye, we worry about the broken bone later. We must go to the root causes. If a president of a country, my daughter, let me take you, You become the president of Nigeria today. With all good intentions, you are told, do not talk about your military because we got that under our control as France. Do not talk about your financial resources. We control your central bank. We manage your your financial uh, policies. Do not talk about your finances. We have that under our control. Do not talk about your natural resources. Those belong to us. All your contracts, we shall choose and decide who builds your country. Now, if you stay away from all that, You are not free to run your country. What do you have? 
You've given up your natural resources. You've given up control of your financial resources. You've given up control of your military. What kind of a leader are you? I don't care what intentions you have. I don't care how pan-African you are. I don't care how smart you are. Your hands are tied behind your back and you're blindfolded and you are supposed to engage in a fight and win. How? So I'm saying, before we even talk about how good a leader you are, I can tell you, I was joking with a friend. I said, I'm pretty sure right now, President Bazoon is probably happy. Because what kind of country was he leading? He had no power. He had nothing to control. That's a joke of a leadership. So once we understand that, we then go back and say, okay, fine. With whatever you were given, what have you done with it? Now I'm ready to start putting blame on the leader to say, okay, you, were, you had a small budget for, uh, for, for health care. What did you do? Did you at least build one hospital during that year? Now, if it's a foreign minister, uh, a minister of uh, health, who is now failing to do something with that budget for one year, that's why we start putting the blame on local levels to say, yes, as a minister of health, you were given a budget. Show us at least one health hospital you built this year. Show us what you have done. So, yes, we do have our own leadership issues, leadership within very limited uh, spaces. And even in those countries that are not former French colonies, we still have major presence and control by the multinationals who existed during colonization. They just went low, but they're still, by and large, running African countries. They're the ones who are the major employers, and they can manipulate the, uh, the politics because of their presence within the country. They can gang up against a country and decide suddenly 10 of them, 15 of them, can leave the country, taking away with them hundreds and thousands of jobs. So they still have some soft ways, underhanded ways, of dealing and upsetting African economies. It still goes back to the former colonizers. So as we talk about our issues in Africa, let's not look at them in isolation. Let's understand in a holistic way all the issues that are coming to play when we end up with millions of youth unemployed. Why? Understand the entire process. Millions of children going to bed on an empty stomach. Millions of children dying. Women dying while giving birth to another life. Let's understand the entire genesis of what is going on. Because the tendency is for us to be pigeonholed and follow, and follow into this rabbit hole of a tiny little issue without understanding the genesis of that issue. And that is the holistic approach that I want the new African to have, to fully have a depth of understanding of what is going on. So we know when we are fighting, is it a fight that is local, that goes to my, to my house? Is this my village fight? Is it my providential, uh, pr uh, province, uh, provincial uh, fight? Is it a country fight? Is it a sub African sub-regional fight? Or is it a continental fight? At every level, there are certain tools in our toolbox that we need to pull out. But to think you can take a village issue and apply it to a continental issue, that is stupid, that is ignorant, and we want our people to be politically mature and understand what fight this is, where we call for unity at the village level, unity at the national level, unity at the party level, unity at the continental level. So your question is a very difficult one to answer. My key point is to say, at what level is this fight? Mm -hmm. If it is a village fight, I can tell you how to apportion the blame. If it is a provincial level, if it is a national level, it is a continental level. It depends at what level this fight is all about. Dr. Arikana Chihombori Kwao, who is the president and founder of the Africa Diaspora Development Institute, is our guest tonight. And we're discussing development on the continent of Africa. Well, you haven't hidden your support for what has happened in Niger. You've considered, you say you don't want to call it a coup. You say you want to call it a realignment. Uh, but countries that identify as democratic uh, have condemned what has happened in Niger. They think that democracy is very important to delivering on the welfare and security of the people of Africa. Do you agree with them? I agree. Yes, I do agree. And also I disagree. First of all, again, going back to the genesis, keep in mind that we have walked away. We were made to walk away from our own traditional values, from our own culture, from our own indigenous ancestral leadership values. We are following their guidebook. We are following their ways of leadership. What kind of leadership tells you this is democratic? What is democratic? 
about France forcing African countries, bullying African countries into giving up their financial resources. My daughter, answer me. What is democratic about that? What is democratic about France occupying African countries without their authority? What is democratic about France taking uh, natural resources out of Africa? 90%, 95% of Niger's lithium is powering Europe and France. What is democratic about that? So you're saying, oh, forget that democracy. Let's just, po- let's just concentrate on this little bit of democracy. It is stupid. It goes back to the, the col- col- colonized mind. It doesn't make any sense. Before we can talk about democracy in Africa, let's practice democracy from an international point of view. Africa is not going to Europe to steal from anybody. Africa is not going to Europe to invade anybody. Let's go there first. So before you can talk about that, tell me why 90% of Niger is not electrified when their electricity, their lithium is powering Europe. Answer that. Now we can talk about democracy. Let's not be stupid. Reality is what is happening in Niger is those students in that dining room. It's now immunity, immunity, uh, a mutiny. They want to keep their lunch. They're saying this time it's going to be different. We just want to keep our lunch. That's How it. sure are we that this is actually going to deliver lunch to the people of Niger? This is not the first time we've witnessed schools in African countries. And often, I mean, Nigeria is a very good example. Every time a military junta has taken over, you will always find a very good speech. Uh, they want to bring, demo- they want to bring, uh, development to the people or they want to fight corruption. And oftentimes, most times we see that the people rejoice. For a while, until we now begin to see that, oh, the people are dissatisfied and then begin to yearn for civilian rule. How are we sure that what has happened in Niger, what has happened in Burkina Faso, what has happened in Mali, that these developments will actually bring about development to the people of those countries? So what is your solution, my dear daughter? Let's just let let things be. We're going to keep trying. We will keep trying. What happens is if Niger does it alone, they're not going to succeed because it's too small a country. It's already fighting against monstrous forces. That is why this moment is calling for everybody to support Niger. We must come together as a continent. We must speak with one voice. If we do not speak with one voice, even those who tried, are you trying to say Kwame Nkrumah didn't try? He, he tried, but he was alone. He was not supported by many African countries. Had Africa come together when African Union, at, at the African Union in, in Addis Ababa in 1963, when Kwame Nkrumah and the Casablanca group were saying Africa for the Africans and African Union now, had the Casablanca succeeded back in 1963, Africa would be sitting in a different position. So my message to the Africans is, any African country that tries to stand up against the West alone without the support of other African countries, they are not going to succeed. Make no mistake about that. We are a tiny little dot in the ocean. But when we come together as a continent, That's why Niger must be supported. Mali must be supported. They have taken a position that is right, a position that is good for the Africans, a position that simply says exploitation of the continent can no longer continue. My daughter, you tell me, are you okay with all our natural resources creating millions of jobs for European kids when our kids cannot get jobs because our natural resources are not getting value addition? Are you okay with that? Do you call that democracy? Big question. I, I think that that's a question that all Africans will have to answer, but it's certainly not all bad news. I mean, for the longest of times, you have, you know, promoted very strongly the Africa f- Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was signed in 2018. And quite a number of African countries have signed on to that. I think we saw the very first trade happen in 2021, uh, but it's been slowly being implemented. Are you frustrated somewhat with how slowly things are moving with AFTA? Let me tell you the honest goodness tr- truth when it comes to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's a wonderful idea. It's the one thing that the African leaders have been able to accomplish uh, that was discussed during the creation of the OAU. Of course, we talk about one uh, military, we talk about one currency, what customs union and all that. Of all the required pillars of Africa's development, the trade is one issue that the, uh, the heads of states have been able to deliver. However, here is my biggest fear. As long as there's no free movement of people, it's going to be very difficult to implement the African continent of free trade area. 
as long as we still have the exodus of African uh, capacity, uh, we are going to have issues with implementation of the African continental free trade area. My biggest fear right now is that because of the African continental free trade area, we have now put a system in place where if we do not wake up to the reality, we are going to be handing Africa back to the colonizers, this time on a silver platter. Who has the funds to build the transcontinental highway? It's not us black people. Who has the funds and the capacity to bring about the development, to build the ports, to build uh, the infrastructure that is required? It is not us. So who are the companies that are getting the contracts to implement the African continental free trade area? They're Chinese companies. They're Middle Eastern companies. They're European companies. They're Indian companies. It's everybody else except us. I have not seen a push to promote Africans coming together as a continent. I've not seen a push to line, line up the opportunities and say 60% of these must be occupied, must be run. These contracts must be given to Africans, must be given to black people. I've not seen that document that's demanding that X amount must stay with the people. That is where I see the problem going to be. If we do not manage the implementation of the African continental free trade area, we are going to be handing Africa back to the colonizers, this time on a silver platter. That is my, my, my fear, and I hope it does not come to fruition. We need to make sure that we speak very strongly to it. We need a document that says, at a minimum, 60% of all the contracts must go to the Africans. And then we set out a plan to make sure that the Africans are educated and informed about the process of getting these contracts. We must also be very clear about how to mobilize the funding so Africa can be built by the Africans for the Africans. We do not mind foreign direct investment. We do not mind our friends coming to help us, but Chinese do not look to outsiders to build China. Europeans do not look to outsiders to build Europe. No one else looks outside their region to build their regions. Why do we Africans, why must we always look outside? But also the Secretary General for the African Continental Free Trade Area must go the extra mile to educate and inform the Africans and also open doors for those opportunities for Africans to build the Africa that they want through the African Continental Free Trade Area. If that is not done, colonization 202 is around the corner. So what would you then make of this summit, which has just concluded in South Africa, the BRICS summit, which is rounding up now, they say that their bank is going to be, that's the bank's uh, international, the new development bank, which is uh, the name of the bank owned by their BRICS nation, uh, will now be lending out at least 30% of its uh, loans, giving it out uh, in local currency. Do you think this is a good development? I think it's a very good development, but again, it has to be managed. My understanding of that development bank is that the funds will be given to the country, and then their job is to follow behind and, and monitor the process and the manner in which the funds are being used. I think it's a good uh, step in the right direction. I was actually able to meet with their, um, uh, one of the directors uh, for, the, uh, for that bank, a uh, very jacked up lady who understands Africa well. Um, so I think if we do our part as Africans, that's actually a very good thing. But we must also do our part. The problem with us Africans is always implementation on the ground. So it's about education. It's about really coming up with a special focus and, and talking to the people. Let them get a buy-in from the people. Because once people have a buy-in, it's easier for them to move forward. But if the monies are just flooded into the country without the buy-in from the, from the people, without really letting them know, not only from their own little community point of view, but they must look at it and say, what I'm doing is not only for my community, but it's for my country, it's, my, it's for my side of region, and it's for my continent. Let people feel proud of what is going on. Let them understand that what I'm doing right now is actually a fight against the Chinese. It's a fight against the Europeans. So when we go to the world stage, we can stand up together as Africans and say, look what we have done. Just to the extent that the Chinese are proud of having built the China that they built. We too must have that spirit. So that spirit must be, must be, must be cultivated from a village level, from the country level, from sub-regional level, and ultimately to the continental level. 
So as the funds are being pushed into Africa, are we educating our people? Are we making our people feel proud of what they're doing and the effects of what they're doing, how it percolates to a better Africa, which is what we want. Mm. So yes, the bank is a good thing. It's a good starting point and we can actually use it to benefit our participation. And by our, I mean, us Africans, our participation in the, uh, in the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Great outcome, but it must be nurtured. Well, you've been doing a real yeoman's job in the diaspora. Do you ever hope to come back to Africa someday and maybe run for office? Just joking. I mean, I'm just asking. Has he ever no, in mind? I, I am not going to run for any office. The only office I would consider running is the chairman of the African Union Commission. That's it. Because I do feel that there is a need for a voice there. Right now, there is no voice. African Union is like a dead entity. Um, and something needs to happen there. African Union is one entity that could speak on behalf of the continent, that could speak and call out those who are abusing, abusing Africa. It is the one place that we could actually let the world know that the exploitation and abuse of the Africa, Africa, African continent has got to come to an end. That voice is not there. That is the only place that I think I can make a difference. Besides that, no. I'm already in Africa, by the way. I spend half of my time in Africa now. I travel uh, quite a bit and uh, I intend to continue to do so. Well, may God bless and keep you in your travels. Thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy, Your Excellency, Dr. Arikana Chihombori Kwao. Thank you for having me, my daughter. Keep up the good work. We are so proud of all the work that you guys are doing. We look forward to continued work as we build the Africa that we want and as we also stand up on the tallest mountain and tell the world abuse and exploitation of Africa has got to come to an end. The revolution for Africa's liberation has, has arrived. And those who don't jump on the bandwagon, your days are numbered in Africa. Thank you.